the Jewish people have always been drawn to numbers. We have 248 positive commandments in the Torah, which is two to the first power, next to two to the second power, next to two to the third power. And it was also believed that there were 248 parts to the human body. We have 365 negative commandments in the Torah, one for each day of the year. If you add up the 248 thou shalts with the 365 shalt nots, you get 613, which the mathematicians amongst us will tell us is actually a prime number. Kind of interesting. Sometimes we like to play with gematria, the art of assigning numerical values to each Hebrew letter. An aleph would be equivalent to a one, a bet is a two, a gimel is a three, and so on and so forth. Therefore, you can take a word like Adonai, spelled Yud, He, Vav, He, which would be the equivalent to 10 plus 5 plus 6 plus 5, or 26. You can also take a word like Ahava, which means love, which would be the equivalent of 1 plus 5 plus 2 plus 5, which is 13. And then you could take another word like Echad, which can mean one, or it can mean unity, uh, which would be equivalent to 1 plus 8 plus 4, also 13. So if 26 equals 13 plus 13, then maybe God is a combination of love and unity, perhaps. Take it or leave it. But we do like to give money in multiples of 18, because 8 is a chet and 10 is a yud. So when you add them, the number 18 comes out to the word chai, which means life, like the word lachayim. Sometimes we give $18 on an occasion, sometimes $36, sometimes more. No, I'm not going to ask for money at this time. That number 36, two times chai, is a very special number. The Hebrew letters that amount to 36 are lamed and vav. Uh, you may or may not have ever heard of the term lamed vavnik. Uh, it is said that at all times, at any point in history, there are Lamed Vav Tzadikim. There are 36 righteous ones who, according to the Talmud, greet the Shekhinah, the divine presence. We find that in Sanhedrin 97b. And who, might we ask, are these Lamed Vav Tzadikim or these Lamed Vavniks, as they're sometimes called? Legend has it that they are each extremely modest, and upright, often concealing their identity behind a mask of ignorance and poverty, usually earning a meager living through manual labor or tutoring. And sometimes they are called the nistarim, or the concealed ones. In Hasidic folk tales, the Lamed Vavniks are like a cross between secret agents and superheroes. When the enemies of the Jews put the shtetls in imminent danger, the Lamed Vavniks emerge from their self-imposed concealment, and they use their mystical powers to protect the Jews. As soon as their task is accomplished, they resume their anonymity, concealing themselves once again amongst the woodchoppers and the water drawers. According to legend, the Lamed Vavniks are dispersed throughout the diaspora, and they have no acquaintance with one another. On very rare occasions, one of them is discovered by accident, in which case the secret of their identity must not be disclosed. In fact, tradition has it that should a person claim to be a Lamed Vavnik, that is proof positive that he absolutely is not one, uh, since they are known to be so humble and pious that they can never proclaim themselves among a secret sect of special forces of righteousness. Some say the Lamed Vavniks are genuinely too humble to believe that they are, in fact, even one of the Lamed Vav Tzadikim. Some say that were it not for the 36 secret saints, God would wipe out the entire population of the world to begin again, like the story of Noah. However, for the sake of the Lamed Vavniks, God chooses to preserve the world even if the rest of humanity has degenerated to the level of total barbarism. Since nobody knows who the Lamed Vavniks are, maybe not even themselves, we are taught that every Jewish person should act as if he or she might be one of them by leading a righteous and humble life and praying for the sake of fellow human beings. It is also said that one of the 36 
could potentially be the Jewish Messiah if the world is ready for them to reveal themselves. Otherwise, they live and die as an ordinary person. As they pass on, they are said to be replaced by another, so that there are always 36 truly righteous people on the planet at any given time, but for whom the rest of us would perish in an instant. Now, to be honest with you, I don't really believe in gematria any more than I enjoy a good parlor trick. And I don't believe in 36 secret agent superheroes with the power to vanquish our enemies. However, there are times when I feel like certain people can be among the 36 most righteous people on the planet. When we lost Elie Wiesel earlier this year, it was as though we lost a Lamed Vovnik. It's hard to know what to say about Elie Wiesel. Knight, his autobiographical account of the horrors he witnessed at Auschwitz and Buchenwald, at once articulated for the world the particular significance of the Holocaust as a culmination of generations of anti-Semitism, while also personalizing the experience, lest we reduce our understanding to mere facts and statistics. Better than anyone, Elie Wiesel could teach the world about the meaning of the Holocaust and the importance for survivors and witnesses to advocate against all other forms of genocide and persecution. To the Jewish people, Elie Wiesel was a source of pride in our traditions and values. To understand what he meant to the world, one need only consider the citation of his Nobel Peace Prize, quote, Wiesel is a messenger to mankind. His message is one of peace, atonement, and human dignity. His belief that the forces fighting evil in the world can be victorious is a hard-won belief. Elie Wiesel was a profoundly deep thinker who taught us that God and the Holocaust are not things to be contemplated on a superficial level. Rather, they are meant to be grappled with over the course of our entire lives so that we may discern just enough about what is wrong with this world to try to make a positive impact upon it. Elie Wiesel spoke truth to power time and time again on behalf of the Jews from Europe, from the Soviet Union, from Ethiopia, and Israel, and his devotion was extended to all of humanity. He took the worst experience that anyone could ever imagine, and he devoted his life to making ours better. Although I had Elie Wiesel in mind when I first began to put this sermon together, we recently lost another Lamed Vovnik before I could begin. Shimon Peres was born in Poland but he is among the last of the generation of the Chalutzim, the pioneers, to arrive in British Mandate Palestine before it became Israel. Paris fought for Israel in the War for Independence, where he became sort of a protege of Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion. He was elected to the Knesset in 1959 and served pretty much consistently until he became president in 2007. Shimon Peres served in a variety of cabinet positions. He served as prime minister on multiple occasions, and he was Israel's most popular president. When he retired in 2014, after some 70 years of service, he was known to be the world's oldest head of state on the planet. He was fluent in Hebrew, Yiddish, Russian, and English though he never lost his Polish accent. In 1963, he persuaded President John F. Kennedy to sell defense weapons to Israel, forging an enduring alliance to this day. He brought about the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty in 1994, which remains in effect to this day. Also in 1994, Shimon Peres was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize along with Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat for bringing the two of them together to lay the groundwork for peaceful relations at the Oslo Accords. 
Though he could not alone maintain the peace, Shimon Peres personally provided a much needed respite, inspiring a generation that there was a positive alternative to war. I want to share words spoken by Shimon Peres at the Oslo Accords because they're even more relevant today than ever before. He said, we cannot build our future on the ruins of an old order. We are part of a process of perpetual change, which compels us to replace outdated concepts with an approach tailored to new realities. The classical defense strategy was based on three factors, time, space, and superiority. All three have lost their value. If a missile can traverse the distance between the United States and Russia in six minutes, what is time? If a missile can fly over mountains, rivers, deserts, and fortifications, what is space? And if a single bomb can destroy a city, what is superiority? All the classical strategies need to be changed and new solutions found. He continued, to achieve peace, we must first acknowledge the futility of war. The Arabs cannot defeat Israel on the battlefield. Israel cannot dictate the conditions of peace. Israel is not just a territorial homeland. It is a permanent moral commitment. Great empires that once dominated the Jewish people have disappeared from history, yet we survive. What force has sustained us? We have placed morality above physical might. The key to Israel's permanence remains the moral judgment of its leaders, for that is the highest degree of wisdom. At his funeral, President Barack Obama said of Shimon Peres, a light has gone out, but the hope he gave us will burn forever. Shimon Peres was a soldier for Israel, for the Jewish people, for justice, for peace, and for the belief that we can be true to our best selves to the very end of our time on earth. Without Elie Wiesel and Shimon Peres, who will take their place among the Lamed Vavneks of the world? I know of no one who could ever fill either of their shoes, but together, collectively, we can do our part to make up for what we've lost. Rabbi Raymond Zwerin tells the story of the rabbi and the monastery on a mountain high above a small town in a rural part of Italy. The monks were hardworking souls who cultivated grapes and fruits of all sorts, who ate little and slept little and meditated the requisite nine times a day. For years, the fruit of their labors sustained their venture. They sold their grapes and fruit and used the income to plant anew and to maintain themselves and their facility. But over a short period of time, conditions changed. Young monks entered the monastery. The elders took sick or passed away. Indolence, indecision, and changing leadership eroded confidence. Arguments and insults drove wedges between the brothers. Contention replaced cooperation. And soon the monastery was in deep trouble. Some monks left. Others secluded themselves, isolated and solitary. Work was done poorly now, if at all and not in a timely fashion. What to do? The abbot, fearing that the monastery might be shut down and the land sold, called upon an old friend, a rabbi, from a nearby township for advice. The rabbi came to the monastery to visit. After several days of observing and noting and investigating, the rabbi asked the abbot if he could speak to all of the monks together. My dear friends, he began, you are indeed in a perilous situation. There is little income. I see that you are all demoralized. I can only say that you may indeed have to close down this lovely place and go elsewhere. There is one thing that I do know, however. In a vision, I was given a very clear and distinct message. I was told that one of you may very well be the Messiah. A gasp. And then a hush fell over the assembly. A cool chill of heightened awareness spread from monk to monk as eyes darted hither and yon in search of who the special one might be. Could it be the abbot? But he had been here for decades, and under his watch the place had fallen apart. Yet he had called upon the rabbi for advice, so perhaps 
Could it possibly be the newest monk? Or perhaps it's the winemaker, or the novice, or the silent monk who makes the soup on Tuesdays. Who could tell? Who could say? To tell the truth, though, confronted by a quandary of immense proportions, there was a certain transformative excitement about it all. One of us is the Messiah, but which? Yet, if it is one of us, then we must change our approach to one another. For who would ever want to insult or deride or discount the Messiah? Immediately, the brothers began to speak in kind terms to one another. Respect, even honor, was bestowed. Sharing and helping and taking turns became commonplace. Smiles erased the frowns of yesterday. The gardens and fields were now filled with tillers and sowers who now worked with diligence as they pondered. Even the off-bland foods seemed somehow tastier. There was humming, even singing, as the work hours flew by and the prayers took on a vital rhythm not previously experienced. Within a season, the crops returned to full vigor, and surprisingly, word of a new spirit in the monastery filtered down to the townspeople. A few of them made their way up the winding road to see for themselves. Their report brought more visitors, and soon dozens of people were winding their way up the hill to see for themselves and while there to buy a jar of preserves and a bottle or two of wine, and some of those special candles and flowers, and oh yes, that painting, and this finely woven material. Before long, the monastery was a thriving concern, far different from the depressed atmosphere that prevailed only a short time previous. The moral of the tale is obvious to us, if not to the monks themselves. Indeed, no monks at that monastery happened to be the Messiah. But when each was treated as though he could be by the others, the community flourished. Likewise, none of us may be a Lamed Vavnik or even a Tzaddik in the folk sense of that term. But when we treat each other as though we could be, our community and our ventures flourish, especially in this place of worship and song, learning and action. This 5777, let us all treat one another as though he or she may be the one to herald the dawning of a new day and age of peace and prosperity that we yearn for so very much. Kenya he Ratsan. Continue with the song. <laughs> 